Okay, good morning all. Uh, today again, I'm going to uh, uh, tell about uh, something that uh, we have already arranged. Uh, we have extended our uh, international webinar uh, till Saturday, uh, considering the availability of resource person and uh, the topics that they are uh, going to cover uh, are important from the perspective of the uh, UG and PG students. Uh, so let us uh, start our today's session. Uh, so, on behalf of Maratwada Mitra Mandas, so on behalf of Maratwada Mitra Manda Shankar Savan Law College, uh, Pune, affiliated to Savitri Bai Phule Pune University and accredited with A grade by NAC. Uh, welcome you all uh, to international webinar series law and opportunities through young brains uh, so young brains from around the world are, are discussing here international opportunities in the various fields of law uh, today we have amongst us uh, two resource person uh, first uh, advocate uh, wava shane from china uh, she'll be talking about uh, international criminal law and international opportunities and second guest for today is uh, Ms. Sadhana Shri Zado from India, uh, uh, who will be talking about dealing with the challenges. Uh, now, these are the two sessions for the day. Uh, now, because we have uh, uh, online sessions and uh, availability of the resource person, uh, Vava Shane uh, couldn't be able to uh, make it uh, live. Uh, so he recorded the session for the day. And uh, we are going to play the said uh, the same recording, uh, and we are also going to stream it live on YouTube. Uh, so before going to start with the recording, I request uh, Krishna Ma'am uh, to introduce our uh, first speaker. Thank you, Saurabh sir. Again, it is my great pleasure to introduce first speaker of the day, Advocate Fua Vashin. Uh, she completed her graduation in law from China University of Political Science and Law post-graduation in public international law from Utrecht University, uh, which is one of the famous university in the Netherlands. She has completed a uh, diploma in public international law from Sherman uh, Academy of International Law and diploma in law of C from Yesu uh, Academy of Law of C. During her student life, she achieved many awards and scholarship, such as Holland Scholarship, First Prize Scholarship for Academic Excellence, etc. During her student life, she worked as an intern with many famous organizations and firms who are working for privileged community, underprivileged community in China, such as Shisheng, uh, Public Interest Law, etc. Soon after completing her master's, she joined Heng uh, and Partners Law Group as, an, uh, as a legal advisor. Uh, Heng and Partners Law Group is a commercial law firm uh, uh, providing legal services in various countries like from Spain, uh, Cambodia, and most of their clients are international banks, airlines, gas companies, etc. Currently, she is working as an associate uh, in Zhong Lun uh, Law Firm, which deals in mergers and acquisitions, greenfield investment matters in China, Cambodia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Mauritius, etc. Uh, so now uh, I request to Saurabh sir, uh, without any further delay, to proceed with these sessions. Yes, uh, thank you, Krishna ma'am. Uh, now we'll uh, play that video. Uh, if you have any uh, difficulties or doubts or the questions, you can post it uh, to me or to my WhatsApp group, or uh, you can uh, just mail them uh, to the uh, respective uh, speaker. Uh, the mail ID of the respective speaker is there in the slides that uh, she is going to share with you. Uh, so let us start uh, uh, with, uh, with the video. Good morning, everyone. 
Nice to meet you all. My name is Wawa Wa Chen. I am from China, and it is my great honor to be the speaker for today's webinar, International Criminal Law and International Opportunities. Firstly, I would like to express my gratitude to Mel Responda, Mitra Mandel Strakarel Travel Law College, Pune, and to Sir Jadev, the executive president of the college, and of course, to Professor Wu Balei, who is a friend of mine and who was kind enough to invite me to speak in this international webinar series, Law and Opportunities Through Young Brains. I also would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the college for receiving A grade by the National Assessment and Accreditation Council of India. I believe that despite the recent divergences in political issues between China and India, for us as law students, academics, and law practitioners, academic collaboration is still important and we should keep the conversation going especially in the field of international law, which also explains the reason that I'm here today. I'm sorry that due to the conflict of schedules, I had to record a webinar in advance instead of broadcasting live, which may make it less interactive if compared to the other webinars by other guest speakers where they broadcast live. But please feel free to reach out to me by email after the webinar if you have any questions or comments and I will be more than willing comments, and I will be more than willing to respond to them. Now, a brief introduction about myself. I'm currently an associate at Zhonglin Law Firm in Beijing, China. I graduated from China University of Political Science and Law in 2017 with an LLB and from Utrecht University in the Netherlands in 2018 with an LLM in public international law. I currently work as an, uh, for the past two years, I've been working as a corporate lawyer and my daily job is mostly on transnational mergers and acquisitions. But when Professor Uba Lei approached me and asked me if I could speak on one of the webinars, my immediate thought was perhaps it would be interesting to share some of my preliminary knowledges and experiences with you on international criminal law. Though I don't currently practice this particular branch of international law, I have systematically studied the subject in the previous years of my legal education and have also gathered some hands-on experiences. In 2018, I interned at, at the Inter International Co-Investigating Judges Office at the United Nations Assistance to the Khmer Rouge Trials in Cambodia. In 2019, I coached two Chinese universities in their participation of the International Criminal Court Chinese Mood, and one of the teams made it to the semifinals in the Hague. For me, international criminal law is interesting, thought-provoking, and worth diving into. I hope by sharing with you some of my preliminary understanding of the subject, you guys will feel the same. So, in order to give a very brief introduction of international criminal law, I have divided today's session mainly into five parts. What is it? Why is it? what it contains, and how does it function? And lastly, what are the opportunities in the field? Now, turning to the first and the most fundamental question, what is international criminal law? There has never been a single agreed definition of the term. In the most simple sense, it can be described as the law that deals with the criminal responsibility of individuals for international crimes. In general, there are two views in regards to the scope of international criminal law in the narrow sense and in the broad sense. In the narrow sense, as well as in its most technical sense, the term 
international criminal law is used to refer only to those few core crimes established directly by international law and subject to the jurisdictions and practice of international courts and tribunals. These crimes are genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crime of aggression, which we will speak about later in details. It involves only situations where individual perpetrators are prosecuted before international tribunals for violations of those crimes established by international law, and the criminal responsibilities and punishment are determined and imposed by international law instead of domestic law, both substantively and procedurally. Meanwhile, in the broad sense, the scope of international criminal law is wider. Firstly, in its view, international criminal law not only contains those core crimes mentioned above, but also covers the other transnational crimes which are not prosecuted by international criminal courts and tribunals, but have been agreed by the international community and defined in multilateral treaties as international crimes. These crimes include, for instance, piracy, drug trafficking, human trafficking, terrorism, money laundering, and, and etc. The individual perpetrators of the core crimes as well as the transnational crimes can be prosecuted both by domestic authorities under domestic law and uh, by international authorities under international law. Because prosecutions carried out in domestic courts are based on domestic implementations of international norms, they are sometimes said to represent the indirect enforcement of international criminal law. For the purpose of today's webinar, I will be taking the approach of the narrow sense rather than in the broad sense. To summarize and also, in the words of Professor Antonio Cassese, which is one of the who is one of the most well-known and leading scholars in the field, international criminal law is a body of international rules designed both to proscribe certain categories of conduct and to make those persons who engage in such conduct criminally liable. And turning to the second question. Why is, why is it, what is the purpose of international criminal law? As some of you might have learned, in its most classic sense, public international law is the law that only governs the relations, rights, and obligations of sovereign states at international level. Sovereign states are the subjects, individuals are not. However, this has been changed ever since the introduction and development of international criminal law as a branch of public international law over the last 70 years, up to World War II. Under the framework of international criminal law, individuals, rather than states, become the focus. The question is, why is that? Why does international criminal law need to bring individuals to the international level? Isn't it enough to prosecute those responsible for crimes at domestic courts under domestic law? What is international criminal, criminal law all about? To answer this question, one must go back to the modern region of international criminal law, the Nuremberg trial. Atrocities committed by Hitler Nazi Germany before and during World War II resulted in the first successful effort to prosecute individuals before an international court for violations of international law. In August 1945, several months after the war in Europe had effectively ended, the four principal allied nations, namely the United States, France, the United Kingdom and the Soviet Union reached an agreement to create a tribunal for the just and prompt trial and punishment of the major war criminals of the European Axis countries. This so-called London Charter or Nuremberg Charter established an international military tribunal consisting of only four judges, one appointed by each of the four signatory countries. The tribunal, which subsequently took its seat in the German city of Nuremberg, had jurisdiction over three main categories of offenses. 
crimes against the peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. There were four judges, one each from Britain, Russia, French, France, and United States, rather than a jury. The judges considered more than 100,000 documents and heard 94 witnesses. They ultimately found 19 defendants guilty of at least one charge and declared three organizations to be criminal. The sentences ranged from 10 years imprisonment to death by hanging and were imposed on 12 defendants. The Nuremba trial marked the real beginnings of modern international criminal law and established a system where individual perpetrators can be prosecuted for violation of international crimes. The purpose of international criminal law can be explained in the words of Justice Jackson, who was chief of counsel for the United States during the Nuremberg trial. This is the last paragraph of his opening statement on November 21st, 1945, during the Nuremberg trial. Civilization asks whether law is so laggard as to utterly helpless to deal with crimes of this magnitude by criminals of this order of importance. It does not expect that you can make war impossible. It does expect that your juridical action will put the forces of international law, its precepts, its prohibitions, and most of all, its sanctions on the side of peace, so that men and women of goodwill in all countries may have lived to live by no one's life underneath the law. Peace, order, security, stability, punishment, deterrence, natural justice, reconciliations. These are the words that people will generally give when asked about the purposes of international criminal law. In the international uh, system, as in most human communities, criminal law and the threat of prosecution and punishment for its violation serve primarily to deter future violations. From this perspective, it may make little difference to the individual perpetrators whether the prosecution and punishment take place in the domestic level or at the international level. What matters is the likelihood that an illegal act will, if in effect, entail serious consequences and serve the purpose of deterrence. However, in a decentralized legal system consisting of independent states with different jurisdictional approaches, the certainty of punishment is obviously dim diminished. One state may have different rules than the other about exactly what criminal behavior is prohibited, and jurisdictional hurdles may prevent prosecution of perpetrators for acts committed in the territory of the other states. From this perspective, the creation of, of supranational courts for the prosecution of the most serious crimes makes it more likely that those who break the rules will in effect be called to account and thus strengthen the deterrence factor. Another important goal of international criminal law is to help keep the peace. Maintaining good order is a function of law in general. International law serves to enhance peace and security in the world community, in part by constraining the use and abuse of the use and abuse of power by providing a forum for the prosecution of those who commit the most serious abuses international criminal court helps deter those who would commit such acts not just for humanitarian reasons or because those crimes violate fundamentally shared values of the world community but also because those acts tend to threat threaten the very fabric and structure of the international system, demonstrating that there can be no impunity for these major crimes helps to create trust and respect for the developing system of international criminal justice. The prospect of prosecution and punishment thus serves a preventive and stabilizing purpose. So turning to the third question, what does international law contain? 
There are currently four kinds of crimes which are generally defined and accepted as international crimes under international criminal law. Genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and crime of aggression. Let's take a look at each, at each of them one by one. Firstly, genocide. The term genocide is of relatively recent origin. It was formulated by Raphael Lemkin, a Polish lawyer, to describe the horrific atrocities taking place in Nazi-dominated Europe before and during World War II. The indictment at Nuremberg actually employed the phrase deliberate and systematic genocide, but because the term itself had not been included in the London Charter for the Nuremberg trial, it was then not a distinct crime within the jurisdiction of that, of that tribunal. However, the crime was codified shortly afterwards in the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in 1948. That convention entered into force on January 12, 1951, and as of June 2013, it had been ratified and or adhered to by 142 states. Interestingly, in the same year as the Genocide Convention entered into force, the International Court of Justice declared that genocide constituted a violation of customary international law in the adversary opinion of the reservations to the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. In the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, genocide is defined as follows. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, as such, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And secondly, another crime, crimes against humanity. The concept of crimes against humanity was firstly articulated as an international offense in the London Charter. Article 6C of the Charter defend offense to encompass murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, and other inhumane acts committed against any civilian population before or during the war, or persecutions on political, racial, or religious grounds in execution of or in connection with any crime within the jurisdiction of the tribunal, whether or not in violation of the domestic law of the country where perpetrated. In Article 5 of the ICTY statute, the statute of the International uh, Criminal Tribunal for the Yugoslavia. Uh, it defined crimes against humanity as the cr crimes when committed in armed conflict, whether international or internal in character, and it added imprisonment, torture, and rape to the list compared to the London Charter. Further, in the statute of the International Court, the International Criminal Tribunal of R Rwanda, the UN Security Council limited the definition to crimes when committed in armed conflict, whether international or internal in character. Sorry, um, in Article 3, the, in the ICTR statute, it replaced this armed conflict nexus with a more general requirement that the specific crimes have to have been committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack against any civilian population or on national, political, ethnic, um, racial, or religious grounds. This is what Article 7 of the Rome Statute of International Criminal Court says about crimes against humanity.
and you may take a look. And thirdly, the war crime. Broadly conceived, war crimes are violations of the specialized laws and customs of, of war applicable in armed conflict. Article 8 of the Rome Statute uh, con contained a lengthy and detailed list of war crimes that can be prosecuted before the International Criminal Court. For the purpose of this statute, it says war crimes means uh, firstly, grave breaches of Geneva Conventions of 12 August 1949. And so, what are the Geneva Conventions? The Geneva, the four Geneva Conventions include the Conventions for the uh, Melioration of the Condition of the Wounded and Sick in Armed Force in the Field, and for the Amelioration of the Condition of Wounded, Sick, and Shipwrecked Members of the Armed Forces at Sea, and the third one uh, on relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, and fourthly, to the protection of civilians in time of war. These treaties apply primarily in international armed conflict. In 1977, two additional protocols to these conventions were adopted relating to the protection of victims of international armed conflict and relating to the protection of victims of non-international armed conflict. The primary focus of these protocols was the protection of civilians and those out of the fight. Together, the four conventions and the two protocols came to be called the Geneva Law. And not every violation of the 1949 Geneva Conventions amounts to a war crime. Among those that do, certain violations of these conventions constitute more serious offenses than the others and are termed grave breaches. The four conventions each define the term grave breach by reference to specific offenses, including among the others, willful killing, torture, Inhumane, inhumane treatment, willfully causing great suffering or serious injury, and taking the hostages. Grave breaches only arise when committed in international armed conflict, and victims of great breaches must be persons specifically protected by a Geneva Convention, such as a prisoner of war or a soldier who, due to wounds, is no longer capable of fighting. A state party of the Geneva Convention is obliged to bring those who commit great breaches before its national courts or to hand them over to another state party. The fourth and the last crime among the four core, core crimes is the crime of aggression. The crime of aggression is the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, integrity, or independence of another state. It is in Article 8 of the Rome Statute. Here it says, crime of aggression means the planning, preparation, initiation, or execution by a person in a position effectively to exercise control over or to direct the political or military action of a state of an act of aggression, which by its character, gravity, and scale constitute a manifest violation of the Charter of the United Nations. And um, for the purpose of paragraph one, Act of aggression means the use of armed force by a state against the sovereignty, territorial integrity, or political independence of another state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the Charter of the United Nations. This crime, was uh, the crime of aggression, was formerly covered under the term crime against the peace under Article 6 of the London Charter in the Nuremberg trial. The definition of this crime was adopted um, in the Rome Statute at the first review conference of the statute in Kampala, Uganda in 2010. The Assembly of States of the Rome Statute adopted by consensus a resolution on the activation of the jurisdiction of the ICC over the crime of aggression uh, as of 2018, July 17. So the fourth question is, how does international law 
international criminal law function. As I have mentioned earlier, the core international crimes can be prosecuted both by international courts and international, uh, both by domestic courts and international ones. In the real world, international criminal law functions through these international courts and tribunals, and they can be divided into three categories. The ad hoc tribunals, the hybrid courts slash the internationalized domestic courts, and the permanent permanent court, namely the International Criminal Court, which was established by Rome Statute and located in The Hague. So the first type, ad hoc tribunals. This would include, um, among others, International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, uh, ICTY. ICTY was the body of the, the United Nations established to, to prosecute the serious crimes committed during the Yugoslavia Wars. In 1991, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia began to dissolve. In this process, deep-seated ethnic tensions fueled violent conflicts, pitting various groups against each other responding to reports of massive atrocities and killings, and uh, fearful that the fighting might spread further. In May 1993, the United Nations Security Council established a tribunal in accordance with Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. It was the first war crimes court created by the UN and the first international war crimes tribunal ever since the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials. The tribunal was charged with prosecuting persons responsible for serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of the former Yugoslavia since 1991. The tribunal released its final judgment on November 29, 2017, and formally ceased to exist on 2017, December 31. During its 24 years of operation, a total of 161 persons were indicted. Another ad hoc tribunal is the International Criminal Tribunals for Rwanda. It is also established by the UN to prosecute international criminal crimes. The background is as follows. The genocide which took place in Rwanda during the spring and early summer of 1994 is very well known. It occurred in the context of long-standing conflict between the two main ethnic groups, the majority Hutu and the minority Tutsi. While estimates vary, between 800,000 and a million people died and perhaps half a million women were raped during the 100 days of that ethnic conflict. Most of the victims were Tuzis, and most of the perpetrators were Hutus. In November 1994, the UN Security Council acted on the Chapter 7 to establish an ad hoc tribunal, and the International Criminal Court, uh, Tribunal for Rwanda was created for the sole purpose of prosecuting persons responsible for genocide and other serious violations of international humanitarian law committed in the territory of Rwanda between 1994 January 1st and 1994 December 31st. Now, turning to hybrid court or internationalized domestic courts. The ad hoc tribunals like ICTY and ICTR are not the only means of dealing with violations of international criminal law. In the past several decades, other alternatives have emerged in the context of post-conflict accountability. In some cases, the choice has been to create specialized courts or chambers within the relevant domestic legal system. In others, the tribunals are freestanding, essentially independent of the domestic legal system. Under either approach, proceedings can be internationalized through provision of assistance from other countries or the UN or even the appointment of foreign judges. Examples of the hybrid courts include 
the special court for Sierra Leone, the special panels for serious crimes at East Timor, and the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. I will not go into details about the first and the second, but would like to briefly introduce the ECCC, which I have interned with myself. ECCC, also commonly known as the Cambodian Tribunal or Khmer Rouge Tribunal, is a court established to try the most senior responsible members of the Khmer Rouge. also known as the Popa region, for alleged violations of international law and serious crimes perpetrated during the Cambodian genocide from 1975 to 1979. Between 1975 and 1979, an estimated up to 2 million to 3 million people died as a result of starvation, disease, overwork, or atrocities committed during the rule of the Khmer Rouge. Eventually, Papa, uh, who is the leader of the Khmer Rouge regime, and his followers were ousted by the Vietnamese army. But little was done to bring the responsible individuals to justice. In 1997, Cambodia's two co-prime ministers wrote a letter to the Secretary General of the United Nations requesting assistance to set up trial proceedings against the senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, at that time, although Popa himself uh, died in 1998, there were also also, some other senior leaders of the Khmer Rouge uh, regime who were uh, alive and can be tried. And after lengthy negotiations, an, an agreement between the royal government of Cambodia and the, the UN was reached and signed on 2003, June 6, on the um, establishment of the ECCC. The agreement was endorsed by the UN General Assembly. And when it comes to the organizations of the court, it, the organs include co-prosecutors, co-investigating judges, uh, judicial chambers, which will include pre-trial chamber, trial chamber, and Supreme Court chamber, defense support, victim support, civil party lead co-lawyers, and office of administration. Under the agreement with the UN, the tribunal is to be composed of both local and international judges. Uh, because Cambodia was previously a French colony, and due to Cambodia's predominantly French legal heritage, investigations are performed by the investigating judges. Um, just like in the French tradition, and who will conduct investigations and submit a closing order stating whether or not the case will proceed to trial. Uh, I was myself interning with the international co-investigating judge uh, when I was there. Um, and um, after the closing order was submitted, both the pre-trial chamber and the trial chamber uh, will decide whether the case shall proceed. And um, the pre-trial chamber and the trial chamber are composed of uh, three Cambodian and two international judges, while the Supreme Court chamber is made up of four Cambodian judges and three international judges. So far, there have been four cases before ECCC and 10 persons were charged. Among uh, the 10 senior leaders charged, some of them, unfortunately, because they were too old, they died uh, during the long proceedings and they did not live to see the verdict. I've downloaded um, some photos from the official website of ECCC and you can see this is a picture of the chamber. 
And on, on the left side, uh, this man, his name is Ian Seri. He was one of the senior leaders of the, of the Khmer Rouge regime. Um, he was then the deputy prime minister as well as the foreign uh, minister. Um, he was uh, found to be guilty of um, crimes against humanity, and um, on, but uh, he died uh, in 2013 because of heart problems. So although he was uh, convicted, he did not leave to live uh, in long enough to see the verdict of the case. And the the one on the right side, uh, he is the international co-prosecutor and uh, he's not he will he was uh, giving his uh, statement uh, during the proceeding so uh, other than the ad hoc tribunal and the hybrid courts the last category of the international criminal courts and tribunals is the permanent court and namely the international criminal court the International Criminal Court is the first permanent or standing tribunal established expressly for the purpose of prosecuting the international uh, criminal crimes. Unlike the ICTY and ICTR, it was not created by the UN Security Council, but instead by a multilateral treaty named Rome Statute, concluded at a di diplomatic conference. Uh, the treaty was concluded on July 17th, 1998, and as of today, there are 137 signatory states and 123 member states to the statute, and not including um, major states like USA, India, or China, unfortunately. And um, the court was formally established after the Rome Statute entered into force on July 1st, uh, 2002. Its headquarters is in The Hague, the Netherlands, and it has over 900 staff members, members from approximately 100 states. So far, uh, there have been um, 28 cases before the court with some cases having more than one suspect and involving jurisdictions like the Democratic Republic of Congo, Uganda, Sudan, Afghanistan, Myanmar, and so forth. The SEC judges have issued 35 arrest warrants and 17 people have been detained in the ICC detention center and have appeared before the court. 14 people remain at large and charges have been dropped against three people due to their death. The judges have issued so far eight convictions and four acquittals. I have found a video on the official website of the court which concisely introduced the purpose, history, jurisdiction, and operation of the court. So let's take a look. How can the victim of mass crimes have recourse to justice? And how can we prevent atrocious crimes now and in the future? The world is taking action against atrocious crimes with support of the international community, including civil society groups. Countries worldwide created an international treaty in 1998. The countries ratifying the treaty started to grow, and it took effect in 2002, officially establishing the International Criminal Court, or ICC. The court is unique in that it was created by a treaty and not by the United Nations, which it cooperates with but remains independent from. The ICC tries individuals, not countries or organizations, for four crimes. Genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and once the 2010 amendments to the Rome Statute take effect, the crime of aggression. 
Since the ICC was established in July 2002 and does not have retroactive jurisdiction, the ICC cannot address crimes committed before July 2002. The ICC has jurisdiction in these locations. First, on the territory of states' parties or countries that have accepted the ICC's jurisdiction. Second, in other countries if the crimes are committed by nationals of states' parties or countries that have accepted the court's jurisdiction. Third, in other countries if the crimes were referred to the ICC prosecutor by the United Nations Security Council pursuant to a resolution adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter. The ICC does not try every case in these locations. Countries have the primary responsibility to do so. The ICC does not replace national courts but complements them. As a court of last resort, it only prosecutes cases when a country is unwilling or unable to do so genuinely. The ICC conducts work both in the courtroom and in the field and relies on cooperation with countries in order to fulfill its mandate, particularly for making arrests, transferring arrested persons to the ICC detention center in The Hague, freezing suspects' assets, and enforcing sentences. The Rome Statute created three bodies the court, the trust fund for victims, and the assembly of states' parties, which provides oversight management. The ICC has four organs. First, the presidency, then the judicial divisions, with 18 judges divided in three divisions, pretrial, trial, and appeals. Third, the Office of the Prosecutor, which is an independent organ of the court and which conducts investigations and brings cases before the court. And finally, the fourth organ is the ICC's registry, which provides support so the court's work runs smoothly. The ICC exists to hold people accountable if they commit atrocious crimes, thus helping to prevent such crimes from happening again. So um, that's it for the introduction of the International Criminal Courts and Tribunals. And on the uh, very last part of this webinar, I would like to briefly talk about the opportunities in the field of international criminal law for those who are interested, um, mainly from four aspects based on my own experiences, um, moot courts, educational programs, internships, and research resources. So firstly, about moot. I know that just like in China, moot competitions are important in India as well. Moots, they are fun, the problems are usually interesting yet very challenging. It usually involves a lot of complex and cutting edge legal issues. And therefore, during the process, it always takes great efforts for students to write the memorials as well as to prepare for the oral present presentations. It challenges your capacity, both working individually as well as in a group with your teammates. And that is why moot court experiences are really a great resume builder. And I assume most of you have heard about, if not have participated in, those well-known international moots, for instance, like Jessup in the field of public international law, this moot in the field of international commercial arbitration, and Telders, which is uh, less well-known, but they're all uh, like a, like a European version of Jessup and Frankfurt Investment Moot, which is a moot for investor state arbitration and etc. And with international criminal law, the most well-known moot is International Criminal Court Moot, the ICC moot. It is a large-scale international moot court simulating the proceedings of the ICC. Originally founded in 2004 at Pace Law School at the USA and developed into an international moot over the years. 
It is currently organized by the Grosje Center for International Legal Studies at Leiden University in the Netherlands and takes place annually in May and June in The Hague, also in the Netherlands where the ICC is located. I uh, found out that in several countries, the ICC mood has national rounds before the international rounds takes place, including China and India. And the national round for India is organized by the National Law University, Delhi. And if you are interested in participating in the ICC mood, I'm sure there are more information available on the internet. Besides the I'll also attach here the um, official website of the of the mood for your reference. And um, besides the ICC mood, the Nuremba mood is also a very influential international criminal mood, which uh, Indian law schools and law students usually take uh, place. Uh, we usually, sorry, usually participate in. Um, Nuremba mood, as its name suggests. It's an international criminal law mood competition held in English language in Nuremberg, Germany, where the famous Nuremberg trial took place. And participating teams from all over the world will argue a fiction case before the International Criminal Court during a three-day competition. They will prepare two written submissions and pleadings from both the prosecution and defense positions. And what's really, really fascinating about this mood is that students are given the opportunity to plead at the historical uh, courtroom 600 in the Nuremberg Palace of Justice, where the Nuremberg trial took place. And secondly, when it comes to education programs of international criminal law, I divided them into two categories, uh, master programs and online non-degree courses. Um, I have here listed a few master programs for your reference in case some of you might be interested in pursuing a master degree in this field. Uh, of course, if you want to become a researcher or a practitioner of international criminal law, a relevant master degree will be a must. This include, among the others, um, Leiden University, which has an LOM program in international criminal law, as well as University of Amsterdam, uh, both of them are Dutch universities, and the Geneva Convention, it has an, uh, a great master program in international humanitarian law and human rights, and the Univ University of Nottingham, the UK, uh, it has a master in international criminal justice and armed conflicts. Of course, besides the degree programs, uh, thanks to the development of the internet, there are also some high quality and free courses and materials accessible online. For instance, on the famous e-learning platform Coursera, there are two excellent courses on international criminal law that you, you can enroll for free. One being the International Law in Action, Investigating and Prosecuting International Crimes by Leiden University, and the, one, the other one being Introduction to International Criminal Law by Case Western Reserve University, uh, USA. I have taken these two courses myself, and I can tell you that they are absolutely great. They are well structured with abundant contents and uh, just great in introductory courses for the beginners. And another recommendation from me would be the UN Audiovisual Library of International Law. It is a perfect audiovisual library for international law students and researchers. It contains several courses given by the most leading, well-known, and authoritative experts in the field of international law in all the five UN official languages. Here you can find lectures of not only in uh, relating to international criminal law, but also other branches of public, public international law, for instance, international environmental law, international investment law, and so forth. And next, I would like to talk about 
internship opportunities in the field of uh, ICO. I guess it is not difficult to imagine or to anticipate that internship and career opportunities in the field of international criminal law are not that easy to obtain if compared to those at domestic commercial law firms or courts, mainly due to the reasons that these positions are usually within the UN system and have quite a strict requirements towards the potential candidates. In general, for the applicants, the popular choices usually include the ICC uh, MICT, which is a residual mechanism uh, for ICTY and ICTR. It's also located in The Hague. The STL, uh, the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, also in The Hague, and ECCC, which is uh, located in Cambodia. And the UN internships are usually between three to six months, but with the possibility of extension, depending on the rules and circumstances of the institution. They are unfortunately mostly unpaid. So if you want to do internships with the UN, you need to either have the economic resources to support yourself during the internship or find available scholarship opportunities. The locations of the internships can also vary. In The Hague, in New York, where the UN headquarters are located, or elsewhere. For instance, Cambodia, where the ECCC locates. And the application materials usually include, uh, in addition to the form that you need to fill out and submit, uh, your resume, your motivation letter, and two reference letters and writing samples. It is, it is optional. Um, for instance, the ECCC does not require require a um, writing sample from the applicant, but the ICC does. It does require a writing sample uh, in the field of international criminal law of uh, no more than 750 words. And when it comes to the required uh, qualifications of an ideal candidate for such internships. I have picked up some of the qualifications from the website of the ICC and put them on the slide for your reference. Education, the candidate is required to have a degree in law or a relevant legal qualification. Uh, I mean, for legal internships, of course, or to be in the final stages of the studies at a recognized university. So you can either be um, bachelor student in the uh, probably in the last two years of your study, or uh, you you could be a master or PhD student when you apply for the internship. And the candidate must demonstrate very good knowledge in international, national criminal law, comparative law, and criminology, and, and so forth. Uh, either one of them, and. Uh, you are expected to have a very good record of academic performance. Um, proficiency in English will be required in English or French, because one of the working uh, languages of the court is French. But if you can speak both, of course, uh, it's better. Um, if you only speak English, then the other would be desirable, but not a must. And knowledge of another official language of the court, Arabic, Chinese, Russian, and Spanish, it will be an asset. As for experiences, the, uh, as for internships, the, the institutions, usually they don't necessarily require you to have um, experiences in the field because it's only an internship program. And uh, I would also like to talk a little bit about my internship experiences. And I was fortunate enough to be selected to intern at the International Co-Investigating Judges Office at the ECCC for four months in 2018, which was one of the most memorable and fascinating experiences in my life. The work itself was very interesting. I was helping the legal officers with uh, preparation of the legal documents, the closing order of case uh, number three. And I was analyzing all the criminal evidences uh, date back into the 
uh, Khmer Rouge um, region in the 1970s, and it was really moving and touching to read the um, the, the the stories of the victims, and uh, it was truly exciting to be able to be part of the process of um, international justice. And what's more, the very international, friendly, and supportive environment is what really impressed me the most. I work in an office where the co-workers were from seven different jurisdictions and all speak different mother tongues. My uh, boss was, um, uh, uh, she was uh, from France and uh, her boss is is a judge from Germany, and we we have interns from uh, like uh, India, China, USA, uh, Australia, and uh, Spain, Italy, and so forth. So the atmosphere there is really lovely, and I have really learned a lot from my colleagues who are really really um, professional. And uh, last part, I would. Uh, talk about research resources. So um, I have attached here some of the electronic resources of international criminal law that I found useful, including research guide, database, journals, and so forth. And I, due to the limited time of the webinar, the time constraints, I would not go into details on these resources. I have shared this slide with your professor, so if any of you is interested in these electronic resources, you can browse them by yourself after the webinar. And well, that brings to the end of today's webinar, uh, International Criminal Law and International Opportunities, a brief introduction. So on and on which I have briefly introduced what international criminal law is, its purpose, origins, the most fundamental crimes, the courts, tribunals, and uh, lastly, the opportunities in the field, including moot court uh, opportunities, internships, etc. And I hope by this webinar, you have grasped some basic knowledges and concepts of international criminal law, and hopefully, to some extent, it can spark your interest towards international criminal justice. And once again, many thanks to the college and to Professor Ubalay for this wonderful opportunity. Thanks to everyone for your patience, and if you have any questions or comments regarding the content of today's webinar, please feel free to email me. I will respond to them as much as I can. I hope, I hope you have enjoyed today's webinar, and thank you, thanks again, and uh, see you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you on behalf of uh, Marathwada Mitra Mandal Shankar Alsaman Law College. Uh, now I hand over to uh, Krishna, ma'am. Yes, Krishna, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Half of the LCI place my heart to stand towards uh, Advocate Fuava Ems, who has given the extensive lecture on international criminal law and opportunities in it through the recorded lecture. Uh, she worked very hard to make it more elaborative, uh, informative, and interactive. Uh, in spite of this is the recorded lecture, we couldn't find it as a recorded one, and I think this is the success of this session. Uh, I am really thankful towards the effort she has taken for this recording. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I express my heartfelt thanks towards the uh, Dr. Kranti Deshmukh, ma'am, for her encouragement and guidance. Uh, and I express my heartfelt thank towards um, uh, Saro Bhuvales, sir. Without you, uh, this won't be possible. Uh, thank you, sir. And lastly, I express my heartfelt thank towards all the participants. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you, Krishna, ma'am. Uh, now, without wasting much more time, uh, let us move ahead with our uh, second session. Uh, so we have uh, amongst us uh, Ms. Dhanashri Zadho, madam. Uh, her topic is uh, dealing with challenges. Uh, now I request uh, Kranti ma'am uh, to address the gathering. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
after listening uh, one uh, lecture on the topic of law the second lecture is very different and it is a need of time because we all are uh, suffering in, in this pandemic situation and uh, motivation hope all these things are required for everyone so today we have with us uh, dhanashri gare madam uh, and i will not say that she is a guest because we always can, she is a part and parcel of marathwada mitra mandal and she had interacted with our students on many occasions provided guidance uh, to students on many uh, what we can say for many reasons and she had conducted certificate courses also in our college so today again she is available and uh, she will be having or she will be interacting with you on uh, different issues which are cropping up during this pandemic situation and i hope all participants they will get benefit of um, this motivation and not only today's lecture uh, on behalf of ma'am only i am conveying it to all participants that after this lecture also if you want to be in touch with madam for any guidance uh, for any suggestion uh, definitely you can contact her at any point of time i think assistant professor mayura sarnya madam and krishna madam they are looking after it they will connect you to the madam and uh, i hope uh, she will uh, give guidance to the students so without wasting much time uh, briefly i will tell madam about this program madam this is one international webinar which we are conducting since monday uh, many resource persons they have uh, joined us and they have provided very valuable guidance to all participants uh, and i must say that this would not have possible uh, without the effort and dedicated uh, dedication uh, of coordinator of this uh, international webinar assistant professor saurabh bubare sir and assistant professor uh, krishna badade madam they are uh, taking so much efforts to uh, make this happen so i congratulate them uh, today is friday means today is fifth day of this international webinar and again we are having two enriching sessions um, in this international webinar so uh, we are conducting this international webinar uh, in the memory of let shri shankar rao ji chavan we are celebrating his birth centenary year and in his memory to offer tribute to his work we are conducting this program so without wasting much time i hand over session to the coordinator and once again i welcome dhanashri ghare madam to this international webinar and i convey my heartfelt thanks for accepting our invitation thank you so much thank you so much ma'am thank you ma'am uh, now i request uh, krishna ma'am uh, to uh, introduce our uh, today's guest thank you saurabh sir it is again a great pleasure to introduce second speaker of the day dhanashri ghare ma'am ma'am has completed master's degree in psychology from pune university and additional uh, master degree in psychology from university of dayton usa she practices rational emotive behavior therapy and has been trained in rept at institute of uh, psychological health pune she is also a trained uh, pranayam teacher and continues uh, to practice yoga under the guidance of dr uh, samprasad vinod she has been conducting sessions on various topics like happiness emotions taking responsibilities meditations etc she also has a certification in teaching english with concentration in business english and she has conducted several uh, uh, sessions in person uh, and online she provides counseling to the students whenever required and also offers counseling to the parents she has been taking steps uh, to help students dealing with their anxieties uh, and build their confidence level through one on uh, one sessions and i think students have witnessed this too uh, she is counselor at our uh, institute and always available uh, for our students whenever uh, the need to talk and more than that she is a family member of our institute so ma'am once again i welcome you in this session and request you to start with this session thank you so much ma'am um, i would first of all like to thank principal ma'am uh, saurabh sir and krishna ma'am for giving me this opportunity of talking in an international seminar so that is really nice 
and i congratulate all of you for doing a wonderful job because i think international seminars help students to see you know something beyond whatever they normally do and i think it helps in their own perception and that is what my talk today is going to be also about so um without much uh, ado i'm going to start sharing my screen um, and then i'll start with my presentation okay so the talk for today you know like ma'am said is about dealing with challenges and bouncing back you know how we kind of use whatever resources we have whatever resilience we have and are able to come back to whatever it is that we have to face so this is no doubt you know the context that right now we're using is the pandemic situation the covid situation but the talk today is also for your future so you know whenever you come across any challenge any struggle and you know i'm assuming we are human so all of us experience even day to day challenges that we see and so to some extent we need this ability to bounce back to have that resilience in ourselves and especially for you law students you know you're going to you, you've been choosing a profession law uh, which kind of you know needs for you to become more uh, you know able to bounce back from challenges so i think this is more apt for you students also and by bouncing back what we mean is you know when we have major minor problems and it's not like these problems are only for adults even as students we experience your our regular stresses whether it is about submissions whether it is about social issues or you know anything in small failures in life whatever you know we experience and then there are these struggles and challenges some of you might be you know living in uh, rural india uh, rural parts of maharashtra so you probably even struggle with getting online so these are your regular struggles and challenges and then you start questioning what is the use i can't even hear i can't even i don't even have, have access to all these things and it kind of gets very frustrating and we lose out on you know whatever mental calmness that we have and then the downward spiral starts okay so sometimes these things become very unbearable especially in the last few months what we have been observing around us whether it is people whether it is students children everybody is experiencing some level of anxiety some level of sadness that you know we are stuck at home we don't know what to do and whether it is little children or adults who are not able to go to their jobs or people who are not able to earn money because of the pandemic it is become very you know anxiety evoking and depressing saying sometimes you know there's a lot of hopelessness also so we're going to kind of look at in our own ways how are we able to deal with these problems because of which you know there's a lot of unpredictability in life also so you know uh, we have a lot of anxiety and like i said you know when we talk about psychological well being or uh, you know uh, the common term for this is feeling happy but happy is not really an exact term because when we talk about happy people think of jumping around you know if you've seen winnie the pooh there's a character in winnie the pooh which was the first slide and uh, his name is tigger so he's constantly jumping around always happy okay so this is not what we want that to be jumping around all the time but a decent level of feeling good so that i am able to complete my tasks whatever it is that i have to do on a daily basis you might be attending lectures online so you know you might be having assignments so am i able to complete all these assignments and do, do i feel motivated do i feel hopeful that you know things are going to be different whatever it is this pandemic situation is only for a small period of time and after that things are going to come back to normal am i mentally focused because a lot of times if i'm feeling so anxious about whether there are going to be exams how am i going to deal with these things then we lose our mental focus and then obviously you know your confidence level also goes down you start questioning everything you know like they say empty minds devils workshop so right now you're at home you're probably attending lectures for a couple of hours but other time you're free so what are you telling yourself during this time are you telling yourself oh my god this is what i don't know english is something i don't know you know right now um, the session that you had she talked about how you need english for international moot courts also so then you know one thread of thought goes into that place oh my god you know if i don't know english then my future is ruined or whatever so these are some things that we kind of bring our confidence level down to and this is what is linked with our psychological well being so how motivated how good do i feel how hopeful do i feel this is what we are trying to see and this is what we are trying to raise in this session today so you know the opposite of having a good level of psychological well being would be feelings of helplessness 
i can't do anything you know i'm here what if my you know internet just goes off i'm helpless i can't do anything even if i wanted to attend a session i can't so these feelings of helplessness again you know as a result of that not feeling hopeful so hopelessness anxiety feeling low and this is what we're listening to every day you know whether you open the newspaper everywhere around us there's a lot of negativity around us so these are the emotions that we're trying to focus on and before we start i want to ask you a question if i were to ask you that on a scale of 1 to 10 with 1 being least and 10 being most how would you rate your psychological well being you know what we just saw above feeling good about things how would you rate it in uh, at three levels one is before the lockdown so how did you feel before the lockdown started and then now now as in during the lockdown when once the lockdown is in place how are you feeling now what is your psychological well being level no doubt it is going to be different from day to day but overall we're looking at an average and then if i ask you that what is your psychological well being level going to be 3 months from now so if you were to predict what it is going to be how would you answer this now i don't you know we don't have the time to ask each one of you but commonly what we have seen is people would typically say you know before an adversity people would say oh yeah you know before the lockdown Down, i was very happy in jan in feb uh, i was going to college i was doing this i was doing that and my psychological well being level was probably 7 8 okay we not all tigers so you know very few of us would have a 10 level but we might say 7 8 was good enough and then if i ask you what about now you might say obviously you know it's gone down to 3 4 because of all this anxiety because of everything that is happening and we don't know what is going to happen down the future so that is why my psychological well being level now is somewhere maybe 2 3 those of us who get extremely anxious might say even 1 0 depending on you know if there are other problems going on in your life and then if i say what about 3 months from now what is it going to be um again you know we might say okay that depends on the situation but most of the times what we have found is that most of us tend to use the present situation in order to predict what is going to happen in the future which means if i'm feeling terrible now for whatever reason maybe you know i've had a fight with a friend or i'm feeling like a failure i'm feeling horrible i'm crying based on this psychological well well being today i tend to predict that for the future and i say things are not going to change things you know it, i'm i'm feeling very hopeless about the future and you know this point is very important because a lot of things that we have been hearing you know people taking drastic measures like sushant singh rajput committing suicide or so many others you know we open the newspaper and there is at least one suicide this is happening because of you know this uh, prediction going wrong that 3 months from now i'm going to be the same and this is a big problem so what i'm going to do in my talk is i'm just going to talk about two fallacies or two mistakes takes we make when we perceive things or when we see things or when we try to interpret things okay so uh, fallacy one is past is usually perceived as more positive so anybody in this you know webinar i won't say room but in this webinar if we were to ask you uh, what is the best time in your life now college students might say or oh, right you know college uh, going to college every day was a very good time in my life and adults you know those who are teachers might say oh childhood was the best part of my life but if you think about it even during childhood we had our share of problems like you know there was one strict teacher who would make us feel horrible and we wouldn't want to go to school we'd get butterflies in our stomach and for that you know for us at that time that problem was very big or we had parents who told us when to study what to study how much to study we couldn't bunk so we had our own set of problems there but because it is a distant past now and provided that we don't you know we didn't have a very painful childhood most of us say oh that was the best period of my life and in fact you know there are so many songs based on that you know bachpan ke din whatever so uh, now past is usually that's why i say past is usually perceived as more positive when i asked you before the lockdown most of us said oh yeah i was very happy but think about it you know you had submissions you had so many things going on were you really happy were you really yeah compared to this maybe but more or less you know a psychological well being level keeps going up and down and it is not like you know that period i was very happy so we had our own stressors our own challenges even at that time so this is fallacy number 1 that past is usually perceived as more positive than current nobody will say oh yeah i'm happy now in a different way but okay you know i'm psychologically fine now i've accepted certain things about uh, you know whatever is happening so this is fallacy number 1 or mistake number 1 mistake number 2 is future prediction is based on current state of psychological well being so if i'm feeling terrible today i'm going to feel terrible tomorrow i'm going to feel terrible one month from now two months from now and this is where most of the problems actually occur okay now um, one very important thing you know one very important research was conducted to study this as in when adversities affect people when you know people experience a lot of problems 
um, how is their psychological well-being level affected? You know, in short, we can actually right now just call it happiness level. So I don't have to say the psychological well-being part. How is their happiness level affected in adversity? So an adversity might be an accident, something like what we're experiencing today, joblessness or anything. Okay. Uh, whether it is losing your house in a flood or something on at those uh, levels. So how does it get affected? And people like Daniel Gilbert, Ed Diener and Kahneman, they did, conducted a research study on this. Now, you know, commonly even we feel that looking at people around us, if you know of somebody who had a major accident and they've lost their limbs, they've lost both their legs and we think about it. And if I were empathic, I would feel, oh my God, if I were in his per this person's place, I would be miserable. I would be, you know, my psychological well-being level would be maybe zero or even below that. I mean, at 21, if I lose my legs, what life do I have? Okay. And then we would also say there would be no hope for the future. Nothing would change. And it's a, you know, ruined life. It's miserable. It's terrible. So this is how we would label it. And we would have no hope for the future. Obviously, you know, psychological well-being level would also go down. Happiness levels would go down. So this is what they had. They wanted to study from a research perspective, you know, whether this is really true or is it something that we just, you know, common man, like we talked about the fallacies above, is that a part of a fallacy? Now, you know, some of us kind of get repelled by research studies. Oh my God, you know, research studies are something where uh, common people won't understand because there's so much of uh, statistical language there. Um, but I'll tell you, you know, sometimes research, especially in social sciences, um, help a lot. And how is that? So I'll give you an example. When you were six or seven years old, let's assume you, uh, nobody in your family or nobody even around you knew that your milk teeth fall off at the age of six or seven and that permanent teeth you you know you have permanent teeth another in another couple of years what would happen if you didn't know that your parents didn't know that there would be panic there would be anxiety they'd be running from doctor to doctor you know what has happened is something wrong is this a disorder is this a problem whatever okay the reason we don't get anxious the reason we don't kind of you know get worked up or feel miserable about this is because we have this information from our parents, from people around us, that your milk teeth fall off at this age, but, and it's a normal, you know, way of uh, growing up. It's a normal stage of development and it will, you know, your permanent teeth will come back in another couple of years. So you don't have to worry about it. So can you imagine how much psychological anxiety that saves us from, you know, we don't really have to worry about this. Oh yeah, that's fine. This is a normal stage. I'll get over it. OK, now this is something which is very important information. And that is why today, whatever I'm going to share with you will help you kind of deal with your problem in a similar way. So I'm going to share a graph with you. This was done by Daniel uh, Gilbert. And what he wanted to see, like I said, was that after an adversity, after people lose limbs in an accident or, you know, they have a major illness or they lose, you know, their house, jobs, whatever it is. How is their psychological well-being level impacted immediately after that situation? What he found was that their psychological well-being level went down to zero, one, uh, maybe even minus one. And then when he just got talking to these people that, you know, OK, so what do you think you're going to do in life? And, you know, uh, people said, no, we have no hope. There is nothing we can do. So obviously prediction was also zero, one, two, depending on, you know, how severely they uh, looked at their problem. And then what Daniel Gilbert did is he went back to these people after six months and then he asked them again, what is your psychological well-being now? And they said, yeah, our psychological well-being has come back to what it was before the accident, before the incident, which is maybe six, seven, like I said, you know, so you have a baseline psychological well-being level, which is different for all of us. So some of you might be more happy-go-lucky. Some of us might be mostly at five, six. And the good news is you can increase your baseline level. Uh, obviously, this is not the crux of our talk today, so I won't get into there. But just for your knowledge, you can really increase that. Otherwise, you might say, oh, my God, you know, my baseline is low, so I'm going to always be down there. What he found was that in spite of people having something terrible in their life, they were able to come back to their baseline level, which means how they were feeling before the incident. And they seemed to be OK. They adjusted, they adapted to it very well. You know, a classic example would be if you go to the paraplegic center in Pune, where our Jawans have lost their uh, limbs, you know, and uh, they actually play basketball sitting in their wheelchairs. If you watched them playing basketball in their wheelchairs, you will actually question, you know, whether they even are aware that they don't have limbs. So they have come back to their psychological well-being level of, you know, what it was before um, actually having that accident or before that incident. Then Daniel Gilbert and Ed Dina wanted to study what about positive events in our life? You know, we think that, you know, God, if I just get this one thing, I will be happy and I'll be happy for the rest of my life. 
okay so many of us have experienced that also that i get a laptop you ask your parents just don't give me anything else give me my two wheeler and that's about it i mean you know i won't ask you for anything and i'll be very happy throughout my life and then you realize that after two three days you're again back to your baseline which is okay yeah you know your uh, vehicle has become old you don't really uh, you know value it so much now so you come back to your baseline and this study they did with people who had won lotteries so even after winning lotteries of millions of dollars they came back to their baseline level okay now this no doubt this is a little sad you know uh, i mean i would want to stay at 10 right if something good happened but then it isn't it better that even after having something you know experiencing something very tragic very bad i am able to come back to my baseline provided i give myself time okay so this is very important and this is an important take away for you because this is what tells us that no matter how horrible circumstances get our psychological well being can come back to normal and you know psychological well being is very very important because unless you feel good or feel like doing something you are not going to do that so that is the reason you know when you get up in the morning and if you feel oh my god i just don't feel like attending lectures i don't feel like doing anything i'm feeling hopeless worthless anxious everything all the negative feelings put together then in that case you are not going to get up and do anything in your life okay so that is the reason you might have everything and many of us say this right see you have everything you have a house you have uh, you know you have money you have food on your table and in spite of that you're not able to produce good work that is probably because my psychological well being level is not up to its mark and that is what is really troubling me um so again you know if i know if i know this information that uh, yeah psychological well being level is going to come back to normal then what do i really have to be scared of what we are scared of is mainly fear of failure and falling down so you know but if you understand this today that yeah even if i fall down let's say you know you go to this moot court you decide okay fine i'm going to take part in this international moot court my fear is going to pull me back no what if i fail what if i don't do very well in that then you know it, it'll be such a laughing stock people will la laugh at me that oh you know you went for the international one and you didn't do well you fell down and then that feeling is going to stay with me forever but if you just heard the above study you'll realize that you are going to come back to your normal level of functioning as far as psychological say is concerned so why do you have to worry about it so the biggest reason we are scared is fear of failure falling down and that is the reason we don't attempt a lot of things so before we go on i want to share a quick 2 minute video with you and in this i just want you to observe this little you know this infant this baby who is trying to walk and just see how many times he is actually you know um, stumbling and falling and then we'll move on uh, with our session
So if you saw this little kid falling down, you know, initially he wasn't even able to take one step without falling down. And thank God that this kid doesn't have a voice in his head which says, you know what, you've been walking for so many days, you're still not able to talk, otherwise, you know, still not able to walk. And in fact, most of us wouldn't even be able to walk if we had that judging sound constantly at the back of our head. And this is something very important, just like walking is a skill. Every day we're learning a certain skill, whether it is, you know, whatever you're learning in law or outside. So look at it that way that, yeah, if I fall once, twice, thrice, that's fine. I just have to continue doing that. What most of us do is fine, give up, you know. Uh, if I can't do this, if I am not able to do a presentation in one go, then I'm not, you know, this is not meant for me. I'm not somebody who should be able to do this. I'm a very shy kind of a person, so I shouldn't be able to talk in front of so many people. So this is where, you know, uh, failures and setbacks kind of hold us back. And, uh, you know, this is what's something Thing that causes more problems so the two takeaways at least from whatever we've shared so far is one we come back to our baseline level of psychological well-being so don't worry about it you have a safety net and two success at a skill doesn't happen in one strike whatever it is whatever it is that you want in life you have to know that it is not going to come in one step you have to constantly continue taking steps every um, you know every way um, now, the last part of this session is giving you more practical tips of how we can improve our psychological uh, health. And, uh, you know, you have these three, let's assume that these three are doors. So you have thoughts, emotions, behaviors. And then in the middle of this triangle, you have your psychological well-being or mental health, you know, happiness. So you want to enter through these doors because obviously all of us want to feel happier than what we feel. And so you can enter through any of these doors. These three are the options. It's not necessary that you have to come in through one door because if you look at the arrows, they go both ways. So your thoughts affect your emotions. The emotions affect thoughts. Same thing with emotions affecting behavior, behavior affecting emotions. So they are all interlinked. So that's why I say we can uh, enter through any door and I'm going to just uh, be very specific of what I mean by these three doors. So you can remember it for, with an acronym, which is BET, BET. So B is behavior, E is emotions, and P is thoughts. Only when sharing this with you, I'm going to go the other way around. So we're going to start off with thoughts. And what are thoughts? You know, on a daily basis, you must have heard that we experience about 32,000 or sometimes even more thoughts. Okay, we're not even aware of most of them. So for instance, right now you're listening to the session and some of you might be wondering, you know, what time should I eat my lunch? Should I eat at one or two? So that is a very neutral thought. It doesn't really impact your psychological well-being, depend, you know, what time do you eat is not really going to impact your well-being level. But a lot of times we have a string of negative thoughts, which we don't realize we are creating. And that is where there's a problem. And, you know, uh, I'll give you an example. Let's say you fail in one exam of your first semester. Okay, you have never experienced failure till then. You've been an average student, but you've never experienced failure till then. Think about what thoughts start off in your head. First of all, oh my God, that is horrible. That is terrible. Uh, you know, I always knew that I won't be able to law. look at the English, look at the language. This is so difficult. I don't think I'll be able to do this at all. I should have just listened to, you know, whoever told you not to do law. I should have just stayed back. This is terrible. You know what? I have always been unlucky with whatever I did. I've never achieved. I work so hard and I've never achieved something uh, major in my life. This is just not fair. And what is the use of doing this, you know? Uh, I'm worthless. I feel useless. So look at where we go from, you know, what uh, trigger. So it's just that you failed in one subject in one semester. Now, I know it is very difficult to catch these thoughts. But it is important to catch these thoughts because what your thoughts are going to do is the minute I say, oh, my God, I'm useless, I'm uh, worthless, then it is going to impact my emotion, which is going to be, yeah, I feel hopeless. I feel, you know, not good about myself. And when my emotions are affected, emotions basically put my behavior into action, then my action is not going to happen. So then I say, oh, my God, I'm feeling so terrible, so horrible. I just don't feel like doing anything today. I don't even feel like opening my books. I don't even feel like, you know, going online for the lecture. I just don't feel like doing anything. So this is how we create a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it's not that when I think of something, it happens. It is because when I think of something and I add a lot of negative thoughts to it, my emotions change, my emotions become more negative. And when my emotions become very negative, I don't feel like doing or, you know, whatever needed behaviors, whether it is of studying, whether it is of exercising, whatever it is that I need to do, I don't put them into action. On the other hand, if your friend, your best friend who you've been with since childhood, if she comes to you and she says, hey, you know what, I'm feeling really bad about myself. I failed in one subject of the first semester and I don't know, I mean, if I should continue, I'm feeling really horrible and I didn't know whom to talk to. 
and you do you tell her that you know what since school i always knew you were not a very bright student you know you do you remember how you failed in chemistry physics in one year the next year you failed in something else and you actually i shouldn't be saying this but i think you are useless you're worthless do you shouldn't be doing law in fact you shouldn't be doing anything just stay at home and whatever little bit you can do or get married just don't do anything okay i don't say this to my best friend what do i tell her i tell her hey you know what hang on you have failed in one subject in one semester that also probably because you have come from you know rural maharashtra you have tried to settle you've tried to adjust in pune it is difficult to adjust in you know in a new place with no, not having family around and plus you have just failed by five marks i'm sure you can work on this maybe you can talk to our teachers i can help you out with something we'll work on this then how does your friend feel she feels good but when it comes to ourselves what do we tell ourselves i'm terrible i am horrible i'm i'm worthless i shouldn't be doing this look at other people look at how they are speaking english i can't speak english this is not not just fair, you know not fair i've been working so hard and in spite of that i don't so look at the amount of negativity and the negative thoughts we create in one minute just you know you'll be able to real you'll be amazed at how fast we can create a whole bunch of negative thoughts and then we put it together and then we wonder why i'm not feeling like doing anything so what we need to do is learn to stop those thoughts just like you did for your friend you just need to do it for yourself and this is how you create the self fulfilling prophecy you know that whatever i think about myself i'm going to create through my behavior not through my thoughts you know not just through my thoughts basically and a classic example of self fulfilling prophecy is roger banister in the 1950s you know till that time people thought that one mile you know running uh, a mile was not you know you couldn't do that in less than 4 minutes okay everybody you know whoever ran races they ran in 420 430 and roger banister you know this was a belief of um, sports scientists then that humanly it is not possible to run a mile below 4 minutes roger banister wanted to run the mile in less than 4 minutes and he was trying very hard he tried for 6 7 years he still was stuck at 4 minutes 11 12 and he continued trying finally on may 6 1954 Roger Bannister ran the uh, ran his mile in three minutes and fifty eight and a half seconds. This was a major victory. The newspapers, you know, labeled this as the miracle mile, and because you know this was in, considered impossible till that point. Now, within two weeks, another athlete called John Landy he ran the one mile in three minutes and fifty seven seconds. Within three months, there were three hundred people. who broke this record and they ran the mile in less than 4 minutes okay now what happened in 3 months did the ground change did they get better shoes or did they just get a better ability nothing of that sort happened what really happened was that roger banister broke that mental belief or mental uh, you know schema of not being able to run the mile in less than 4 minutes and when he was able to do that that was a more difficult job everybody else looked at that and said oh my god you know if he can do it i'm sure if i put in more effort i can do it too it's not impossible i can do it so this was very important because he was able to break this mental schema now how how does this apply to us it applies to us by you know i'll give you an example just earlier you heard about international law and she shared some things about moot court and what all you can do internships how many of us the belief that ran through our head is okay this is not for me international not for me okay and why we had our own reasons our own thoughts for that that my english is not good and international look at you know what she is talking i haven't understood you know most of this and uh, winning would be very far and this is only for people who are from national law universities or national law schools it is not for somebody like me who comes from a rural part of uh, in, you know maharashtra or even you know from a very small school i don't think this is for me this is again a another mental belief or mental schema that we have and we carry these kind of schemas everywhere with us right from i am an introverted person i am a shy person i shouldn't be doing this i shouldn't be do, taking part in moot courts forget international moot courts how many of us say okay fine i'll take part in the regular college moot courts no because why we are too scared of failing but when you know that even if i fall even if i fail and even if i feel miserable and my psychological well being level goes down research tells me that i am going to come back to my normal level of functioning so what do i have to worry about i just have to break this mental schema that it is all about these activities that i have to do it's got nothing to do with that you know certain people cannot do this and you know my type of people can't do this and your type of people can't do that it's just about being ready to put in those efforts when i was going through the slides that um, you know the earlier uh, presenter was sharing 
what i realized was that was very overwhelming for me you know so much of language so much of jargon but you know end of it it happens step by step am i ready to take the first step am i ready to go through this what we do is oh my god this is too much close the book and just you know sit back and then it just goes on piling up and then i feel more and more anxious and nothing really changes about it okay so changing your mental schema is very important so when it comes to thought you have to consciously change your thought and try to change it into something which is much more helpful for you okay fine right now i'm not going through a great phase in my life but what is the best thing i can do can i just sit here and torture myself by telling me how bad i am how terrible i am or can i do something more functional can i do something more worthwhile in this time that i have okay so this was about your thoughts so this was one door the second door is your emotions you know when we talk about psychological well being it is nothing but your feelings your emotions so if i want to directly impact my emotions forget the thoughts what about if i want to just feel good about things then how do i you know can i do this directly yes you can there are three ways of doing this one of them the most important one is exercise if you are able to do any kind of cardiovascular strength training mainly cardiovascular if you go swimming running uh, exercise whatever you know it will impact your emotions and i think those of you who have attended my happiness session you know about this you know the power of exercise in changing your mood you will be surprised if you're feeling low and if you just go running and come back you will feel oh my god i'm not feeling that terrible as i was feeling earlier and something has changed inside me i don't know what it's not like i'm feeling great but i'm feeling good enough and i'm feeling more hopeful that i will be able to deal with challenges in my life and there have been research studies by um, you know you can google dr john rayty who is a psychiatrist and he has actually conducted studies where he has found that a uh, psycho you know psychotropic uh, medicines so which means medications that you take for depression anxieties compared to exercise he has found that both of them work equally well in fact exercise works better because when he did a follow up with these patients after 3 months the uh, you know group that was on medication had relapsed into depression but the group that was more on exercise they did not relapse back into depression anxiety so anybody who feels very under confident very anxious about things the one thing that i can definitely you know suggest is exercise any form of exercise now you will start giving reasons you know what it's lockdown how do you expect us to go out and exercise well before the lockdown it's not like you guys were exercising every day so make sure even now uh, you can actually start working out at home whether it is surya namaskar whether it is running and you know this is another place where one of my mental schemas were broken um i run marathons i've run 21 kilometers and uh, i always thought okay fine i can't run marathon so obviously you know i am sitting at home doing nothing and then i heard about this person from pune university who runs there and he ran 21 kilometers in his two bedroom apartment okay can you imagine running 20 i know it might look very awkward and very stupid but the point is getting the benefits of exercise so my mental schema of marathon being run only at the university or at an open space was broken as a result of that so we give ourselves a lot of reasons when it comes to exercise it's raining um, i don't have the space i don't have the time and several other reasons so if you can just quit giving reasons and you know work on that it will directly impact your emotions second is what we're going to do now i want all of you to just sit comfortably wherever you're sitting relax and if you're comfortable with it just close your eyes when you close your eyes you'll become aware of the relaxation you know especially because most of us or almost all of us have been doing a lot of online work and our eyes are being strained because of that so if you just close your eyes and experience calmness experience relaxation to your eyes just become aware of it pay attention to your neck and shoulders this is the part where most of our stress resides so just and you know the minute you say pay attention it automatically relaxes so you don't even have to say pay attention and relax when you pay attention to your neck and shoulders it will automatically relax become aware of how your shoulders go up when you breathe in and go down or relax when you breathe out when you breathe out this is a time when your body relaxes
continue to stay focused on the movement of your shoulder going up and down. If you're touching the backrest, pay attention to what it feels like. And very slowly move your attention to your breathing. Become aware of how you breathe in through your nose. And as you pay attention, you breathe more deeply, letting your stomach come out completely. And when you breathe out, you just relax your body, relax your shoulders, your neck. Continue staying focused on your breathing. If possible, just make a slight sound when you breathe in and out with your breathing. As you consciously breathe in and out. And very slowly open your eyes if you had closed them. When we're in class and if people fall asleep, we have neighbors to, you know, uh, wake them up. Here, if somebody has fallen asleep, I guess your parents will wake you up for lunch. So don't worry about it. Um, so when it comes to meditation, what they have seen is, you know, what you just practiced just for two minutes or even in fact, less than two minutes. This is nothing but meditation where you just focused on your breathing and you kind of tried to create this gap for yourself, you know, from all whatever you've been doing, whatever stressors you've been experiencing. And, you know, when it comes to stress management, people talk a lot about managing stress and especially as lawyers, I think you will have to learn that a lot. It is very important to understand that stress is going to be a part of our life. And in fact, it is very much needed. I'll give you an example. Let's say, you know, during the lockdown period, you decide that, okay, fine, I can't do much of academics. So I'm going to focus on my body and I'm going to try and make a six pack or a great body, you know, chiseled body. So I'm going to do these whatever YouTube exercises at home. But then suddenly your college says, okay, fine, you know, next week or the week after we are starting with college. Now you want to make sure that before your college starts, you want a great body. Do you say, okay, fine, I have 24 hours in a day and I have these next two weeks. So every minute of my time, I'm going to be doing crunches or I'm going to be running or I'm going to do something that will help my muscles grow. And then by the end of two weeks, I'll have this fabulous body. Okay, this is very ludicrous. This is laughable. This is hilarious, right? Nobody does that. And the reason for that is because, see, your body is going to grow because of stress. But along with that, your body also needs recovery period. So that's why one hour of exercise in the gym and then you have your rest. And then again, you go alternate days or whatever is suitable for you. Okay, what the new stress theory say is stress, just like it's needed for your physical in order to kind of change your you know, body. You need it for mental also. You need it as a part of your life to grow. Because if I don't have stress with my presentations and all, I'm not going to be able to do a great job and I'm not going to get better with it. So yes, I need that. But at the same time, I also need a recovery period. What we just did with meditation or with exercise is it gives you this space for yourself, this, uh, you know, this space where you can actually recover. So it, it's not necessary that you need a one week period or whatever for, you know, relaxation. You can build this into your daily routine. So after you finish your online sessions, maybe just before lunch, take five, 10 minutes for yourself, deep breathing. It's not necessary that meditation is the only way for stress management. You can listen to, uh, uh, you know, songs again, provided that you don't stretch it for like three hours listening to songs. You know, it's, it's a recovery, right? So whatever recovery boosters you need. It could be just quick exercise, either just going down the stairs and coming up. If you are, you know, in lockdown and you can't really step out of your building, then just going down the stairs, coming back up or just kind of, you know, 21K marathon was run at home. So you can definitely just run, you know, shoot from one end to the other of your house and then get back to whatever you're doing. So that will kind of relax you. So just find these recovery boosters that will help you. Meditation, exercise are definitely one of the few boosters which will help you deal with your, you know, stressors in life. 
and there has been a, you know those of you who are more into reading there is research by richard uh, richard davidson who talks about meditation and how it has impacted so many areas right from creativity stress to everything and you do need creativity you know when you come to what clause and how to use that and how to kind of work on a case just being stressed is not going to help you you need a calm mind where everything comes easily to you and you will experience that now the only issue with meditation is it doesn't happen overnight you know exercise yes if i exercise today i'll feel at least some of the benefits today but with meditation uh, even though i felt calm for 2 minutes more or less for the long term benefits i need a longer time for that so if you people you know i know students especially young students are very much repelled by the idea of meditation it probably has its reasons you know because so far meditation was just seen as somebody you know sadhus and you know people um, monks doing all this so we are not really keen on doing that but if you know that there are many benefits right from stress management to creativity to so many others you can just google online with richard davidson and i'm sure you'll find a, a google talk or a, a, you know a talk on youtube which exp explains the benefits of this meditation thing the third thing is mindfulness you know mindfulness again is a part of meditation but what it does is it helps us become aware of what i'm feeling so when i ask you to close your eyes and pay attention to your neck muscles your shoulders you were paying attention when you do this with your uh, senses so you know when you see something and you kind of get engrossed in that or a simple thing like when you have coffee in the evening you just sit with that cup of coffee experience the warmth of the cup uh, the flavor the fragrance you know of of the coffee the you know wonderful um, smell that you uh, get all these things together make you feel different and this paying attention to these small things is nothing but mindfulness okay and um, again you know it takes time to get into all this but when you're more mindful you feel less stressed because you're paying attention to whatever you're doing okay and that really helps so maybe mindfulness initially might be a little difficult for you to get but meditation which is nothing but just staying focused on your breathing you know with eyes open also will do is the first step that you can really start off so if you want to directly impact emotions exercise would be the best way meditation if you are open to it fine go ahead and do it uh, otherwise you know um, exercise would be good enough so this is as far as emotions are concerned the third thing we have is behavior now many of us have uh, you know major issues with following through these behaviors you know how many of us have a new year uh, resolution list of 10 things i'm going to eat healthy i'm going to get up on time i'm not going to play pubg i'm not going to do this i'm going to this you know so we have 10 things and then by day 3 day 4 we've lost everything and we're back to our normal routine whatever it is okay so ask yourself what is one thing that you're not doing right now in your life but if you start doing that thing it is going to bring a positive change in your life and it could be a very small thing it could be i just want to study one hour every day okay i just want to read whatever one chapter of this thing every day that's about it okay or i want to just run 1 km every day anything that at least will help you start if i bring that change i just want to meditate for 10 minutes every day then i you know i know that this is going to bring about a change in my life but now my problem is that my thoughts are good you know my thoughts say yes exercise is very good i've read about this and great you know you should start doing it but sometimes when i get up in the morning i say okay fine today it's raining maybe i shouldn't go today maybe you know it's okay if i start next week okay next week is first of august so maybe i'll start then so we kind of you know are not able to um, get those behaviors in place and by behavior i mean all these things of actually studying actually making plans writing a journal or exercising meditating all these are considered as behaviors on the negative end i might have behaviors like crying sleeping uh too much of gaming so all these behaviors i might want to reduce now how do i get about doing that because most of you say no ma'am i try a lot but i just can't seem to get it well the first thing we have to do and have to understand is if you've seen a car you know which is not starting because it was shut off you know the engine was shut off for many days what they have to do is they have to push the car in order for it to get started so the same thing you have to first get that behavior in place whatever you define that maybe one hour of sitting here and studying no matter what i feel even if i feel like i don't want to do this i still have decided that this is something which will help me become more positive or it will bring a positive change in my life i want to do this and i'm going to do this so once you have the behavior in place then forget about your thoughts and your emotions because you know like we saw the graph uh, the picture what we said is that everything impacts each other there was a study done by david bem where he said that even your behaviors impact your thoughts so you know when you attend an international lecture okay an international webinar series 
that behavior itself what does it tell oh my god you know i've been attending this that is amazing so your emotions are also you feel good about yourself you feel proud you write it in your resume so your behavior of attending this session changes your thoughts as well as your emotions so remember it that way if i go exercise if i run today then my exercise even if i didn't want to do it what does it tell me my thought is oh yeah i was able to do it who says i didn't actually you know um, i didn't have self discipline now again coming to this aspect of self discipline you know we talk about how we should have discipline and this and that um new studies are showing that discipline is a very limited resource which means that if i can't really uh, exert discipline in every area of my life whatever i'm able to do it is because it has become a ritual okay and by ritual ritual is something like a habit think about it this way if i get up in the morning you know all of you get up in the morning i don't know what time you get up depending on your lectures but do you get up in your in the morning you're lying in your bed and then you think about this and then you you know kind of uh, have these thoughts oh my god now i have to get up from here walk 10 20 steps pick up my brush put the paste on it and then brush my teeth how terrible is that no none of us have the, these thoughts because you know the minute we get up before we start thinking anything we just automatically go to the bathroom take a brush and do whatever you know we need to do so this becomes very automatic we don't even have to think about this this is what a ritual is and a lot of us have rituals in place okay whether it is related to exercise or whether it is related to studies you know some of you might be doing whatever the teacher has taught today i will just go and jot down what is important i'll mark that and then i'll go home and read it that is a ritual okay because this ritual helps me do things better in a better way and it also kind of you know helps me stay focused on whatever i want to do so start creating rituals for yourself whether it is study related exercise related meditation related when you have and how do you create rituals you create rituals by being very specific so let's say for example if i want to say that okay you know what from tomorrow i want to study at least 1 hour then before tomorrow comes i just don't say i study 1 hour because then in the morning when it is time for me to study i have not specified the time i'm going to study and then i say oh forget it what is the use of it i don't have my books with me no i have okay whatever then you say okay, i'm going to study just this chapter from this you know subject tomorrow uh, and once i decide that then i don't go flipping from one okay this seems very boring i'm not going to do this let me take something else let me see if this is more interesting no then i'm wasting a lot of time and by the end of it i've lost all my energy and my motivation and they, then i say forget it i'm just like that so you know from my behavior which is like i'm not very sure the thought is that okay fine you know you are just not able to take decisions and then my emotions are feeling helpless hopeless and then i kind of get into the cycle of self fulfilling prophecy so i have to be very specific very clear what am i going to do when i'm going to do at what time let's say if i say okay tomorrow morning i'm going to get up and i'm going to exercise okay and then i get up okay then i sit and think what am i going to do should i do push ups but there is no space at home because people are you know sleeping in that room so forget it i can't exercise okay so be very specific with whatever you decide you know whatever behaviors you take and take one behavior at a time if it is studying something specific take that if it is something to do with exercise just take that it takes about 30 to 40 days not 21 days as it was thought earlier to actually create the ritual but once it is in place it will be for for a lifetime okay so look at it that way don't say oh my god you know who has 30 days to just spend on one ritual i have so many other things because even though you say so many things we're not ending up doing anything so why not just focus on a certain ritual and yes let the other things also be in place but be more focused on completing that ritual and let's say you know you decide that i'm going to run in the morning and if you're not able to run then say okay fine today evening i'll finish it but don't kind of see this is what i always knew about myself i'm never able to decide things i'm never able to uh, follow through things and this is how i am i don't think i'll ever amount to anything okay again we are doing the self fulfilling prophecy going through the thought door okay so be patient with yourself whatever it is that you decide to do please be patient it doesn't happen overnight you have to spend some time with it you have to fail fall and then it's going to be automatic and then you won't even know you know before your thought comes in you are sitting and getting your whatever assignment done you know within um, half an hour so then you'll feel good about yourself that you started off with the behavior aspect of it so like i said you can either go through the thought door the emotion door or the behavior door 
sometimes you'll feel that okay you know i can't get through emotions because i'm feeling very bad and thoughts also then you know like we talk about just pushing the vehicles pushing the car so that it starts start with the behavior aspect of it fine whatever i feel this is what i've decided i'm going to run no matter what don't wait for the feeling of wanting to run come don't wait for the feeling of wanting to study to be a part of you no that's fine if it doesn't want to be i will do it anyways and if at all for some reason some day you experience all the doors are closed okay i can't thought door is closed emotion is locked behavior is i just don't feel like doing anything all three doors are locked now what then please communicate talk to your parents your friends your teachers i know you know you're alone at home um, um it may be difficult to find support sometimes um like i said you know i'm the counselor at the college um you can take my number from mayura ma'am or you know any other teacher you can call me i have been doing you know sessions over the phone if zoom is comfortable fine otherwise over the phone and um i think it's not as great as you know doing face to face but it definitely helps so it's not like only when you're going mad or uh, you know something really drastic happens i'm the last resort you can talk to me about even minor small problems in your life but like i said if you're more comfortable with parents friends teachers please make sure you go and talk to them about whatever it is that you're experiencing and remember the graph you know everything comes back to normal provided you know you also stay focused on your thoughts your emotions and your behavior when needed and that is going to uh, create a big impact for you so you know sometimes our perspective also needs to change why do we you know everybody saying oh my god four months economically we are back you know and by by four months and three months and everybody is talking like that but does life always have to be about how fast i can run or how high i can climb it can also be about bouncing back yeah we had a lot of challenges did i bounce back yes did i have the resources yes i just needed to find them you know what is it that i can do in this situation what is the best thing i can do so sometimes you will experience experience yes ma'am what you say is right but there are so many people around me who are doing great but i am struggling with everything that's fine whatever you are made up of you know some people are let's say rabbits some people are are you know uh, hares or tortoises so okay fine if i'm a tortoise and if i'm trying my best to run that's the best i can give excellent it's about what resources you can use what you have and making the best use to go how far you can not about how far the other person or you know other people are going around so in order to maintain your psychological well being also accept this is a part of your life but can i bounce back well can i be can i bring in humor in my life okay fine this is going on but how can i live this better you know you're all given ice cream candy sticks okay let's assume that is your life how you enjoy it is in your hand if i sit craving oh yeah forget it i don't like vanilla this is you know the most pathetic ice cream why did i have to get vanilla i will never be happy but if i enjoy that vanilla more mindfully like we had talked about earlier enjoying the taste enjoying that texture whatever it is i will have lived my life more fully than somebody who just you know kind of wanted to finish it off and look for something else so these are just some you know food for thought i don't think i've shared something out of the ordinary or something that you didn't know but sometimes it is important for us to bring these things into perspective to kind of look at these things again and then work on it with a new rigor you know with a uh, new energy so that we can really work on it so with this um, i'd like to stop my talk um, and thank you all for listening patiently i really appreciate it thank you Uh, ma'am there are some questions in the question and answer okay okay there's one question which says ma'am now a days parents don't know about depression and anxiety students suffer be it any reason can you kindly help to explain it okay now you know there are very uh, there are some of us who experience depression to the extent that uh, they are not able to work on any of these three windows whether it is thought whether it is emotion or behavior okay no matter what they do they constantly feel depressed and that is probably because of some changes in the brain okay uh, some uh, what do you say chemicals neurotransmitters but what you can do is you can see anxiety and depression no doubt they are real also but the way they have been portrayed in the media is not really accurate so if i say that if exercise is helping me feel more positive then instead of you know shirking the responsibility and saying no this is not what i want to be doing at least start off you know like i said bring the behavior in and work on this 
yes parents may not know everything about depression and anxiety then in that case you can help them by you know uh, letting me talk to them or letting you know having them talk to me uh, what if you're comfortable with that uh, but other than that you also need to understand that what you are experiencing you have to be able to differentiate between is that depression in the clinical depression sense or is it something where you know just related to whatever we are experiencing this anxiety related to that is it that and if you have doubts about this please make sure you contact me uh, you call me up and then we can talk about this so i can at least assess if this is you know really clinical depression or it is just something that we have taken on the label because it has been thrown widely in the media you know where people talk about sushant singh rajput committing suicide because of depression somehow it seems that nothing is in my control but you know there's a difference between severe depression and uh, our day to day blues We, everything is clubbed under depression by you know people especially i think because media is throwing this information around and people don't know what it is so what i want you to know is anxiety and depression yes you may be experiencing that right now sometimes you may have the tendency sometimes it is only because of the situation around you so first we should be able to identify that and then if you need medication then we can recommend you to you know psychiatrist and he can help you out with that okay but the most important thing is uh, it may not really be as serious as you know we are thinking especially because of the situation okay um then there's another question ma'am you said that it is important to keep a positive mindset you also spoke about a person's mental state when he compares his school college to that of a national law university but you cannot deny the fact that nepotism exists in this field too how is one supposed to get rid of these thoughts which are a result of derived inference by him okay so yes there are some things which are factual okay there are some things which i cannot change so nepotism might be one of them you know whether it was with sushant singh rajput or whatever we are experiencing but then you know the important thing is what can i change and what can i not change for my psychological well being okay i can't really change the world but i can definitely look at what is it and where can i go to the best possible extent with whatever skills i have and with whatever support system that i have and try to bring my psychological well being level to a 6 7 you know to uh, uh, and then kind of work from there so yes you write some things un unfortunately are there you know like we talk about not being fair uh you know unfairness is also rampant and i'll quickly i think i've shared this story uh, in my classes also you know with unfairness of life that you know this is the basic thing of nepotism is also things are not fair right so what you have to understand is um, fairness also is a concept and um, again i just want to share a story with you um in the 1970s you know with wimbledon uh, there was this athlete uh, a ten tennis player called arthur ash till then all the white people had won wimbledon okay no no other black person had ever won the wimbledon title and in that year arthur ash won the title and when he won the title everybody around the world was very happy for him that you know he broke this entire thing of only whites being supreme in tennis and being a black player he still won the um, you know uh, the the wimbledon and people wrote to him from different corners of the world obviously we didn't have internet then so they wrote uh, letters and they you know uh, talked to him about uh, how inspiring he was and what he had done was so amazing and stuff like that uh, i think within a couple of years arthur ash was um, uh, diagnosed with uh, aids because you know he had a ma minor operation and uh, during the blood transfusion um he got aids obviously at in those times 70s people didn't have cure for aids aids was very new so everybody knew that arthur rash is going to die again people from all over the world wrote to him saying you know you were at the helm of your career you were at the peak of your career and why did this hap have to happen to you this is just not fair so one man wrote to him that arthur rash when you die please ask god why me okay so uh, arthur rash very calmly wrote a response to this man and what he wrote was my dear friend when you know there are millions of people around the world who play tennis very few of them become top seed very few of them go into wimbledon and just one wins the wimbledon when i won the wimbledon i did not ask god why me so why now okay so this is very powerful because a lot of times what we do is yes you know it things are unfair in life whatever it is and yes i agree with you that psychology will not have answers to everything you ask 
but from my perspective what is important is i need to balance my psychological well being my feeling of you know a good mental health along with other things and then i need to know okay at what point do i quit this at what point is this really impacting me very badly and then i have to start working on that but if i continue to stay stare at the closed door okay that no this is just not fair in my life i don't want anything then i fail to see that you know my life is made up of several other aspects if i say okay if i get this job then fine otherwise my life is ruined you know think logically your lawyers is your is your life ruined by one aspect in your life there are so many things that make up your life your family your career and the more you add into this the better you will feel that your life is more well rounded so again it comes back to the you know questions that uh, philosophers had asked end of it what is this life about so i don't know no i'm not sure if i answered your question right um, because you know i answered it more from a psychological perspective but i hope you can at least take some things from it and like i said you know each one of us has to kind of uh, decide for our own selves that whether we just stay stuck with oh this is nepotism this is not fair or whether we move on with whatever i can contribute whatever i can do and there have been people you know look at prakash amte or whatever they are doing they eight years nobody came to them they could have easily just quit that and come back to you know whatever um, comfortable life they were living but they didn't do that so end of it each one of us decides whether you know what is it that we want and how do we want to go about it uh, again there's a question related to depression and motivation and um, if you really think that this is personally what you're experiencing please make sure you give me a call Uh, your names will be anonymous we'll just you know talk over the phone and then we can actually um, you know decide if we we would need medication so this is very difficult for me to answer just uh, by looking at the question that you know whether anxious person lacks motivation then if they are getting depressed then how do they exercise yeah your point is fair but sometimes i can't push myself to behave nor change my emotions nor thoughts so in that case that's why i said talk to someone whether it's a parent whether it's your friend or teacher mainly uh especially when it's related to depression uh, more than friend i think it would be better to talk to one of your teachers or then you can directly contact me and that would be fine uh yeah there's a, there are some questions about uh, science of neuroplasticity connected to psychological wellbeing yes there are n number of ways you have nlp you have uh, pranayam you have yoga anything that works for you so try it out sometimes even cooking helps you know those of you who enjoy cooking you might find that is a stress buster too so you know n number of things and you just have to figure out what suits you best how does journal writing help with self analysis uh, self analysis yes it also helps with increasing your levels of well being self analysis is obviously depending on how critically you're writing it but uh, on the other hand what they have found is if i'm writing a lot of things about what good happened in my day it is actually changing uh my perception towards life and it is making me much more psychologically healthier because of which i'm able to handle more of my problems in a better way okay how do we recognize depression it is very difficult to recognize whether it is clinical depression or whether it is your run the mill uh, feeling blue so that's why i said you'll have to talk to a professional for that and so you can call me up and if you're not in pune then maybe you could find you know a doctor in your hometown but please make sure that you give yourself a chance like i said you know start off with some simple exercise if you don't want to go out play youtube and you know do zumba for all you care you know do something and then if you feel no this is not helping and i'm not able to get out of it like i said please give me a call uh, i have been doing online sessions on uh, dealing with negative emotions also it's uh, it's about 1 hour 1 hour 15 minute i have been doing individual sessions for that if you are interested obviously this is all free uh, since your students uh, you can just let me know a time suitable for you and we can work on this also okay so i know i'm not giving you answer specific to what your concern is but you know i'm just kind of looking at these questions and addressing overall uh ma'am any idea on how much it costs to approach a psychiatrist um, that would vary from psychiatrist to psychiatrist i think 300 to 500 would be typically what they charge um and again like i said before you go the medication route please make sure you have tried at least tried all these other things and then think about this or at least talk to me before you go ahead with this you know if you want a real because again psychiatrist also are very different some of them just completely rely on medication some of them would do a combination of medication and exercise you don't want to be dependent on medication for your whole life you want to develop your own resources unless it is absolutely necessary then obviously yes but please make sure you give your resources a chance to and uh, like i said talk to me talk to a doctor whoever you are very comfortable with please make sure you do that 
how to control aggressive behavior exercise meditation would help but if you're getting aggressive while doing meditation because somebody is making a sound you know and disturbing you uh, then maybe again you know call me and to what extent you're getting aggressive we can talk about that also uh, okay uh there's a question about school fees college fees unfortunately i'm not the right person to talk about that i know it causes a lot of uh, mental trauma you know what is it going to be anxiety but uh, that is not my forte so i will not answer that question i'm sorry um okay there's a question on fixed mindset and growth mindset i'm assuming you people uh, okay oh, it's a teacher so uh, you know growth mindset and fixed mindset is a very um, it's a concept by itself and i generally have a completely different session for that but those of you who have attended growth and fixed mindset it is basically about looking at yourself as a work in progress so if i say no whatever i am today i can work on myself and continue that is having a growth mindset a, a typical example would be you know let's say you are at the beginning of your life and you're given a full cup okay full cup of water and uh, somebody says okay you have to walk from this end to the end of your life making sure you don't spill this water okay and let's assume that all of us have different amount of water in our glasses so you know just like results we all hide our results you know whatever i have whatever marks unless i have full points then i might show it off but otherwise i'll hide and i'll walk right so the same thing a lot of us kind of hide whatever skills we are having let's say i don't know english then what i do is i walk as if i don't speak a word of english because i don't want other people to find out that i don't know great english and so i walk hiding that thing okay and then i don't venture out i don't practice anything i don't try to take resources learn something and i just continue my life without looking here and there just making sure nobody finds out about what i really have and what i don't have on the other hand if you are told at the beginning of your life that hey here take this glass this is an empty glass as you start walking from here to the end of your life no matter how many times whatever times you fall down you will be able to pick up some level of confidence some level of skill in that glass and every time you fall you're going to pick that up okay if somebody says that and then says okay so your focus is you have to fill this glass to whatever um, you know quantity you want then in that case i will be more open to falling down because i i know that if i fall down i'm going to pick that skill up this is a growth mindset where i look at life as something where i can learn you know take cooking for example if i say i can't cook i can't cook i'll never be able to learn to cook but if i say hey let me try my hand at it today it will go bad you know like the falling part of the, you know the, the falling video that we just saw but eventually i'll be able to learn some things what we do is no whatever i do should be perfect that is a fixed mindset where i say no people should think of me as a wonderful person they shouldn't be thinking of me as an idiot and then if i speak like that they'll think of me an idiot see but that is their fixed mindset why are you getting into a fixed mindset down unless i am you know thought of as a fool or whatever it is according to them but i am learning a skill and nothing comes first imagine if that little child who was trying to walk said oh my god i look like such an idiot falling down every step i take i think i shouldn't walk till i am able to walk perfectly well that is the most stupidest logical statement ever made right that i will walk when i'm able to walk better it's the same thing with any skill you have and that is where you need a growth mindset being ready to fall and looking at falling as a part of your life as a very 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 important part of your life the problem with us is we are so scared of failures that we don't want to do anything and that is somewhere you know where you need to bring in a change so that's what growth and fixed mindset are about there are great uh, google talks by carol dweck who actually found this theory of uh, growth versus fixed uh, mindset um yeah is it okay once in a while when we feel like all doors are closed just not do anything at all perfectly fine call it meditation okay so don't worry nothing is like okay this has to be like that yeah if you find it over and over again and your parents are saying you know you're not doing anything at all and you start getting affected by it yes because you know you have a goal in your mind about life and then you have to work towards it so yeah you take a gap but if i take my gap for you know one year without doing anything then i have to decide for myself is this worthwhile or you know what i can do with this time uh what are the top 5 most important behavioral attributes that a student must invest upon to overcome general problems faced by us i'll give you one ready to fail if you're ready to fail as in ready to fall no matter what okay i'll take part in the moot court what's the worst thing that can happen i'll fall down people will laugh at me that's fine my psychological well being level is going to come back to its normal state 
So yes, other important attributes, you can have anything, but uh, look at it from this perspective, thought, behavior, and your emotions and work from it, you know, on it from that perspective. So there are no set rules that this is what I have, but I can definitely compensate on, on those. You know, if I don't have great organization skills, I will make that into a ritual that after every case, I'll write down whatever happened and then I'll keep this uh, log and whatever. So I can learn these things. What we say is, no, I'm not good at, I'm not good at organization. Again, growth mindset, fixed mindset. So yes, what is important is developing a growth mindset for yourself or like I said ready to fail no problem at all you know and then your life will be much more worth living because think about hiding everything and walking not participating because if you fall then people will call you you know uh, names that you fail and that's not good so then the best thing is I just don't participate that is worse um, is it self-talk helpful is self-talk helpful for kids should parents encourage it uh, yes, self-talk definitely is helpful. I don't know what kind of a self-talk self you're talking about, uh, but parents can encourage it. I think I would like uh, more clarity on that, depending on the age of the child and what. So maybe again, you can call me separately and then I can talk. Um, how to motivate a year drop field student as a friend. See, again, uh, year drop is also a mental schema. It's a mental concept that if I failed once, then that is it. My life is over. I will never be able to achieve something great. No, there are so many failures around us who've done great with their life. You know, you might even be able to talk to your alumni. Some of them are doing great work. Okay, they may not have always been A students. So don't use these things to hold you back. This is again a fixed mindset that, okay, fine, if I'm like this, then I will never achieve anything in life. You can achieve whatever you want, provided you put in those efforts through your thought, emotions, and behavior. If you're able to do that, then yes, maybe I won't stand first, but I will feel satisfied that I gave in my 100% and maybe reach whatever, you know, whatever um, level. And trust me on this, that if I have in effort whatever i achieve i feel good about it i don't feel that oh my god you know this is nothing because i i know where i stand with my efforts so again this is fixed versus growth mindset uh, kind of a question so don't uh, put yourself in the box of a failure as a student and then i can't do anything because yes that is a part of your life but that is not the part of your life that is just one small bit of it okay is it normal to have no friends yes it's okay you know, because um, sometimes, you know, uh, I've had uh, people tell me that, see, my daughter should at least have three friends to be considered normal, right? I don't think so. Yes, if you are finding it difficult to not share things with somebody, but don't try, don't start with this that then, you know, I should at least have one friend. Yeah, maybe in this setting, in this, you know, wherever you are right now, I don't have a friend. That doesn't mean you have tried the entire world. You might be close to your family members. That's why sometimes you don't need a friend. Yes, you can work out on behaviors around that, but don't feel bad if you're socially, you are not up there, you know, as people think of it, that you should have a little bit of extroversion. You should be a little outgoing, not necessary. If you can get your work done, and if you are able to talk enough that you can get your work done, whether it's moot court, whether it is whatever, then that's fine. You know, I personally am a very introverted person. But because I find meaning in these sessions, because I find these meaningful when I share it with uh, students or with other people, I get the passion, I get the emotion of talking. Okay, but normal course, I'm a very one-on-one -on -one kind of a person. I'm not an extroverted person at all. Okay, so this is, you know, to answer your question, it's okay to be whatever you are. Don't feel terrible about yourself because I'm not extroverted like other people, you know, or whatever. If there will be an answer, zero, how to answer this particular query for anxious. Many students are worried about what if this year will be announced as a zero year, how to answer this particular query of our anxious, worried student. I don't think that that will really happen. I, again, I'm not the right person to... Um, answer that but you know like i said okay some things are going to be there like a wall i can either bang my head against the wall or i can try and see if this is considered a zero year then what are the skills i can learn academic is one thing but skill learning is a different thing maybe then i can work on my own see again year wise it's very you know we kind of have these uh, notions right that i have to complete this degree in two two years three years four years so again, if you question the validity, is it really needed? No. So whatever skills you feel you need as a lawyer, you can even do that right now, right? Whatever skills you need, you can start working on it from a different perspective. If you are scared of talking to a group of people, make sure you ask the question in webinars, okay? So do these small things. And uh, like I said, you know, that uh, entirely I won't be able to answer. But again, uh, use this time to kind of become more fruitful with whatever you have under your control. Ask yourself, what are the things in my control? Yes, whether the decision of, you know, whether it's zero year or whatever is not in my hands, that's fine. 
then what is in my control in my control i just have my mindset i just have my psychological well being and what i can do with my time that is it in my control i can only work on these things not on other things the minute i kind of uh, just uh, you know narrow down my scope of what i can do it becomes easy for me to target that and just work on that so yes some questions we won't have the answers to so that is fine but as long as um, you know okay i think i've lost track of questions uh, okay how do you directly contact me uh, i'm just going to say out my number uh, out uh, loud so you can get that uh, ma'am i have posted in the chat window okay great so yeah you have my number if at all you do need to contact me please feel free whatsapp me if you are not comfortable then we can decide a time and i can give you a call and i can talk to you uh yeah i think i've answered pretty much most questions if you feel i have not answered your question uh, don't get into the negative talk of only my question didn't get answered see how that is okay so we can get into that also so let's just stop and say okay you know maybe she had so many questions so i'll call her up later and i'll ask my question so that is how we work on our thoughts so i think i pretty much answered most of your questions um, at least to the best possible extent i can do it if you still have questions please uh, call me i can at least direct you to resources those of you who had uh, serious questions thank you so much thank you ma'am uh, i take this opportunity and i uh, express my heartfelt thank to uh, dhanashri ghare ma'am for such a wonderful session i would say uh, this was much needed session uh, in this pandemic situation thank you ma'am for creating a positivity thank among you. all of us um krishna ma'am yes so right yeah. the only that uh, screen was there on the uh, screen ppt presentation was going on so i was okay. uh, i convey my heartfelt thank to uh, dr kranti ma'am uh, for encouragement and support again uh, i would like to thank to all the teaching and non teaching staff of sclc and last but not obviously uh, the least uh, to all the participant i would like to thank uh, for patient hearing thank you all thank you so much dhanashree madam thank you so much thank you so much for advising thank you thank you